Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Ready, Set, Share, Tools for Implementing Shared Decision Making. My name is Rebecca Bally. I am a Facilitation and Improvement Specialist with Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation, which has been contracted by Health Insight Oregon to coordinate and facilitate these Learning and Action Network LAN webinars. My role today will be simply to moderate because we have such a fantastic speaker. Um, first, just a brief introduction to Health Insight. Health Insight is the Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, or QIN QIO, serving Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Oregon. There are 14 QIN QIOs that bring Medicare beneficiaries, providers, and communities together in data-driven initiatives that increase patient safety, make communities healthier, and better coordinate post-hospital care, as well as improve clinical quality. QIN QIO work is grounded in principles aligning with the goals of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, quality strategy, which is to eliminate disparities, strengthen infrastructure and data systems, enable innovation, and foster learning organizations. Along with 13 other regional QIN QIOs, Health Insight is leading healthcare quality improvement initiatives, including the Million Hearts Initiative for the Medicare program for a five-year period from 2014 to 2019, as guided by CMS. This webinar is part of the Learning in Action Network LAN efforts under the CMS project on cardiac health, so Million Hearts. And here is just a quick infographic of the Million Hearts and their targets. You can find out more by visiting the millionhearts.hhs.gov website. And just a, a quick intro into some of our technology that we'll be using today. So throughout the presentation, we'll be checking in with you. And um, to do that, we ask that you please open another internet browser. So you have that ready. We're going to give you a couple different links, one for a video to watch, and then one for a, um, a poll that we're um, going to ask you to participate in. And so you just, just be prepared that you have to have your internet browser ready, ready to go. Um, we've also muted everyone so that we don't get a lot of feedback. However, we can unmute you if you'd like to verbally ask your question by raise, raising your hand next to your name on the right side of the screen there. Um, we do have time set aside to address your questions. Never fear. Um, you can submit your questions in writing, as shown on the screen here in the question pane, and we will sort them and give them to our presenter to answer for you at the end. But again, you can ask to um, submit them verbally if you just raise your hand. We also have a post-webinar survey, so um, please, at the very end, let us know how we did. We always are trying to improve communities. Here are our learning objectives for today. I won't read them out loud because you saw them when you registered. And finally, I'm so thrilled to introduce our expert presenter today. Uh, Meg Bowen, who is a compliance specialist site visitor for PCPCH, the Patient Center Primary Care Home Program, and her job takes her to recognize medical homes across the state. She returned home to the Northwest in 2014 after working in Boston with the Informed Decisions, excuse me, the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation, implementing shared decision-making processes and decision aids in the primary and specialty care practices across the country. She has clinical experience in emergency medicine, primary, and specialty care, first as a medical assistant starting in 1985, then as a nationally registered paramedic and ACLS instructor. She also has experience in quality improvement, clinical data management, primary care transformation, health policy on a state and federal level, and implementation of evidence-based best practices. Meg is also a certified decision support health coach and is very happy to be working with innovative practices in Oregon and around the Northwest. Meg lives in beautiful Wallowa County where she enjoys all outdoor activities and she says it is a privilege to get to visit clinics across Oregon. Thank you so much, Meg. We're in good hands. Great. Thanks, Becca. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to our friends in Mountain Time Zone. Shared decision-making is a collaborative process that allows patients and their providers to make healthcare decisions together. It takes into account the best clinical evidence available, as well as the patient's values and preferences. Patients and providers are both experts 
the provider is the expert in the clinical evidence, and the patient is the expert in their own personal experiences. Shared decision making is not a goal. The goal is better health decisions to achieve outcomes that matter most to the patient, and shared decision making is a way to reach that goal. The proven process to incorporate the patient's voice in healthcare decisions, shared decision making is the pinnacle of patient-centered care. It is appropriate for medical decisions where multiple reasonable evidence-based options exist, for example, lumpectomy versus mastectomy for treatment of breast cancer, or for colorectal cancer screening options. Lastly, shared decision making is more than just a decision aid. Why shared decision making? Well, in 2011, or excuse me, 2007, the Washington State Governor signed a bill that supports the use of shared decision making and patient decision aids for preference-based treatment decisions that involve elective surgery. The state legislature noted that the use of high-quality decision aids, which outlines the benefits, harms, and uncertainties of various treatment options, improves doctor-patient communication and leads to more fully informed patient decisions. Washington also became the first state to enact legislation establishing increased legal protection to physicians whose, whose patients sign an, an acknowledgement that patient decision aids were used during informed consent. By presenting balanced, evidence-based information in a way that a patient can understand, this can help bridge health disparities by bringing the patient to the table and making their preferences a component of the process. Is your clinic ready for shared decision making? What is the motivation for implementing shared decision making and decision aids? What's in it for you? In just a few minutes, we're going to have you watch a great video from the Stillwater Medical Group in Minnesota, which explains the why of implementing shared decision making. Shared decision making isn't just giving a patient a decision aid to read. It is inviting them to be an active participant in the decision making process about their care. Once they are fully aware of the evidence-based risks and benefits, they are better able to make an informed decision with the provider on their best course of care. How many other initiatives are going on in your clinic right now? Transitioning to team-based care? Changing EHRs? It might be wise to wait until this program can get some undivided attention. Successful shared decision-making will not happen without a significant culture shift by both patients and providers. Unfortunately, culture change doesn't happen one procedure at a time. Providers and patients must ex accept together a new and more engaged role for the individual in which the patient's voice is better heard and the patient's voice is better honored. To prepare to, for culture change, make sure you have plans to support providers and patients during this process. You may be asking, how can all of this happen in the course of a seven to 10 minute conversation in the exam room? It is possible, and during this presentation, you'll learn how to harness the power of your entire team to make shared decision-making a reality. Start building your shared decision-making team in the clinic from folks who are passionate about patient engagement. So we just shared a link with you to a short two to three minute video in the chat box. Please click on that link and opening that into your new browser, and we'll give you a few minutes to watch it, and we'll be right back.
Great. So welcome back. I hope all of you or many of you had a chance to check out that video. There is a link to that short video and another longer video from the same Stillwater Medical Group at the very end of this presentation for you to take back to your project teams. Thanks. Now we're going to Okay, so in that internet browser that you still have open, um, there is a link that we've just included in the chat to um, basically provide some feedback for us on what is your motivation for implementing shared decision making. And this is an open text response um, link coming just in a few minutes. It's also um, at the top of the slide here. So poll ev.com forward slash, and I know it's kind of weird, but it's my name, Rebecca Bally, 227. And then it should have just a, a text box for you to chime in. What, what's your motivation? And we'll be able to see everyone's responses here on this slide. We'll give everyone just a minute or two. Oh, these are so great. I hope you can all see these too. This is great. Engage the patient to have better outcomes, absolutely. Increase patient compliance with treatment and better patient outcomes. We want patients to make decisions that fit their life. That is music to my ears, thank you. Yep. Ensure the patient has a voice in their care, absolutely. This is great. Super, thanks. Patient satisfaction. Great. Passionate about patient care. I really like you. Whoever you are, thank you. <laughs> I am too, if you couldn't tell. Great. Okay. So we're motivated. Now what? Let's learn about options and resources available to support your efforts. We're going to review the following resources. The Dartmouth-Hitchcock Center for Shared Decision Making Toolkit. The Ottawa Hospital Research Institute Decision Aid and Educational Resources and the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide. One of the oldest resources in the, in the United States for shared decision-making research has been Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire. We'll be reviewing the Dartmouth Shared Decision-Making Toolkit developed by researchers and clinicians as they explored ways to successfully implement shared decision-making NDAs into routine clinical practice, and they've been at this since 1999. Let's walk through the seven steps of shared decision making from the Dartmouth Hitchcock Toolkit. Step one, is your clinic leadership on board? How will you engage providers, staff, and patients? If you have a patient advisory council, involve them in this process. They will love it. Who are your team members in the clinic who get things done? Identify a champion. Every project needs a champion, and shared decision making is no different. Clinics need at least a provider champion, but ideally there would be a provider, clinic, and patient champion. Step two, goals and scope. Define your goals and scope. What are the goals for this project? A goal would be to improve patient knowledge by introducing decision aids. Scope would be the clinical integration of decision aids. Step three, conduct a needs assessment. A need is a gap between what is and what should be. What do you need to have in order for this implementation to be successful? Think about all of your resources, personnel, tools, electronic medical record, time, et cetera. The next step, selecting decision aids. This is really fun. <laughs> Decide which conditions you'll target for shared decision making. Colorectal cancer screening, low back pain. Do you see these conditions regularly in your practice? The Ottawa Hospital Research Institute has been a long-time researcher in shared decision-making and the use of patient decision aids. This comprehensive list is sorted by topics and includes a fact sheet on each decision aid, including how to access it and the availability. 
things to think about when choosing a DA topic. How often will you see patients with this condition in the clinic? If you choose a topic for a rarely seen condition, you won't have enough volume to assess your processes, and more than likely, you're going to forget about it. The best bet is to pick a decision aid topic that is relevant to your population and is a condition you see frequently. For those of you who have access to HealthWise Knowledge Base through your electronic health records, look at those resources for decision aids that are available already. How will your clinic ID those patients? Do you want a decision aid you can send through the portal prior to the visit? A paper version to hand out with an endorsement during the visit? Great. So now we're going to take a little look at the actual Auto Hospital Research Institute guide. So this is the first list. This is a topic list of different types of decision aids that are available. And this next little screenshot is an actual decision aid fact sheet. And then I, we could click on that and bring up the actual decision aid. So there are many great resources on this website for evidence-based, balanced, and unbiased decision aids. This one is regarding placement of an ICD. This D8 comes in electronic and paper versions and includes videos for patients and providers and is free for use. That came from the University of Colorado at Denver. <clears throat> so these are just some topic headings for decision aids available for heart health. These resources are all available on the OHRI website, the Auto Hospital Research Institute website. And each DA has a decision aid summary and it gives an overview, information about how to use it, and details about when it was created and how often it is updated. And again, these are just the headings. There are many, many decision aids listed under each of these headings. Step five, education and training. So there are great free resources out there for training of providers and staff. Anyone can use the Ottawa Decision Support Tutorial for educational purposes at no cost without permission. We're going to shorten it down and call it the ODST. The ODST is protected, it's protected by copyright, but it's freely available for use provided that you cite the source. Findings from multiple studies show that health professionals and students who use this tutorial have improved knowledge compared to baseline scores and when compared to control groups. Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center has made videos of conventional patient encounters and encounters for shared decision making for both prostate screening and knee osteoarthritis for a referral to an orthopedic surgeon. These are well done and illustrate the conversation between patients and providers. Share these tools with your providers so they can visualize the difference in conversations. So for example, with um, they show a video on what a regular conversation about prostate cancer screening, for example, and then they show a video after a patient has watched or read a decision aid about prostate cancer screening and how the provider engages in the conversation with the patient and elicits their preferences for care. So they're really telling. So the first video is about what the regular conversation is about a minute, two minutes long. And the actual shared decision making video is about three to four minutes long. So it's not incredibly longer. The last resource on this page is a PowerPoint on decision support as a clinical skill. And this is on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock website. And you can share this as well with your project teams. Step six, implementation. This is where it really gets fun. So start small with a single dyad or team. Involve all of them in the design of the process and get everyone's input. Use workflow mapping tools available on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock website or you can do a PDSA or an A3 if you're familiar with those processes. You get everyone's input <clears throat> when you're doing this. So IDing appropriate patients, how will you identify those patients who are appropriate for shared decision making? Are you scrubbing charts? Okay, well who's going to do that? Patients can opt in as well for shared decision making. So our friends at Mass General Hospital in Boston and at Winding Waters Clinic in Enterprise, Oregon, what they did when they implemented shared decision making is they took a very patient-centric approach and they implemented, once they implemented some shared decision making tools and the, into their workflow, and the, the topics that they uh, were going to introduce. So they developed a little list of all the decision aids that were available and the patients received that list when they checked in for their appointment and they could tick off like a Chinese takeout menu, which decision aids they were interested in watching. 
and it was amazing. So we did a small research project on it with Mass General and originally would have only prescribed a decision made for maybe colorectal cancer screening or another preventive service. But when patients were aware of the resources available, they indicated preference for shared decision-making tools around anxiety, depression, insomnia, all kinds of things that might not have come up in the conversation with this provider. It's very, very telling. So make sure that your patients have that opportunity um, if you want to go that way. Getting decision aids to patients. How and when will you get to patients? Through a pre-visit approach? view and discuss during the next visit with a provider. This is a great option for screening and patients can be identified through those great recall lists that I know many of you already generate. Host visit and we'll follow up with a health code manager or provider. That's a great option for patients who self-identify for shared decision making or identified during the encounter with the provider and are introduced to shared decision making during the visit. Here in Oregon, some innovative practices have the DAs all ready to go in the exam room. So the provider or medical assistant can give the information to the patient at the end of the visit with a warm handoff endorsement of the process and the decision aid. Make sure the patients know who to follow up with when they have questions. So some of our clinics in Oregon, what they did is they implemented it's a toolbox. It's literally a physical toolbox. And it's in the exam room and it was right under the counter so it's not in anyone's way. They didn't have to put anything new on the walls and talk to the building folks about doing that. So in these toolboxes, they had decision aids in packets ready to go with an endorsement letter signed by the care team. And the medical assistant, all she had to do was just reach into that box, pull out the decision aid, and do the endorsement. The NA or the provider could do that. And it worked really, really well right there at the point of care. So endorsing shared decision making and the use of decision aids is really, really important. We're asking patients to step out of their comfort zone and to take an active role in their healthcare decision making. Some patients don't want to participate in the decision making process and that's perfectly fine. But they reserve the right to be involved if they wish. Also think about the involvement of family members and caregivers who typically help the patient make decisions in their care. Patients need time to review the information and consider all of the options. Set a recall to check back with the patient and see how far along they are with their decision-making process. A health coach, a care manager, a care coordinator, this is a great tool for them to use to reach out and connect with the patients. Rarely are there decisions that need to be made in the spur of the moment. So closing the loop with shared decision-making is no different than communicating lab or imaging results to patients. But in shared decision-making, the patient is the one communicating with the clinic. Step seven, monitoring the outcomes. We did it. Is it working? Well, you might have already implemented shared decision-making in your clinic and it didn't work. Why not? Monitor your processes as you go using those good QI techniques. That will help you identify breakdowns in the process. Links to quality and monitoring tools are available in that Dartmouth Hitchcock Toolkit and they include satisfaction surveys for providers, staff, and patients. You can look at how many patients were offered shared decision making, how many participated, that's a nice little study. Set goals to increase that number and then try different patient engagement techniques such as endorsement, posters, and encouragement. I worked with a clinic in uh, Iowa and they actually had little buttons made for all the staff and it says, ask me about SDM. And so patients did, what's SDM? And that same clinic uh, had decision aid copies in their waiting room and they had a sticker put on them that said clinic copy. So instead of highlights magazines or sunset magazines, which I would like to read at the doctor's office, they had decision aids. And so the little sticker said, ask your provider for your own copy. So patients could look at that before they even went in. If multiple teams are implementing shared decision making, see where the strengths are within each team and celebrate the successes and share the knowledge of what worked. Let's switch gears and talk about switch gears and talk about supporting patients directly in the decision making process. I strongly suggest that clinics explore decision coaching as a skill for your care team members who will be involved in the shared decision making process. The Ottawa Personal Decision Guide, and I'm going to call it OPDG from now on because it's a mouthful, is a fantastic tool that can be used when making important medical or social decisions. 
This role helps patients consider all of the options, prepare for a discussion with the provider, and implement the chosen option. Now, this is different than motivational interviewing. MI addresses ambivalence to medically indicated behavior change, and shared decision-making supports patients in making healthcare decisions in cases more than one reasonable option. So decision coaches can draw on these approaches alone or in combination to achieve, to achieve patient-centered care across the range of healthcare decisions. So for example, if you've given a decision aid to a patient and you check back in and they haven't watched it, pull out those good MI techniques. Ask them why they haven't watched it and see if they can set a goal to watch that decision aid. So in summary, the steps for shared decision steps for implementation are leadership. Make sure your leadership is on board and engaged and supporting this project. Step two, know your goals and know your scope. You have to identify those. Step three, assessment. What do you need in order to implement shared decision making? Step four, go shopping for decision aids. That's the fun part. Step five, education for your team. Make sure folks are going to be inter interacting with patients are educated, that they go through the Ottawa Decision Support tutorial online, you get a certificate suitable for framing. Um, step six, implementation. This is where the rubber meets the road. Do a small trial at first with one dyad or care team. Start small, don't start big. Start small and learn. And then step seven, monitor your outcomes. Just like good PDSA cycles or drawing up an A3 if you're using lean, monitor to make sure it's working. Is it working for the front, the front office, but not for the back office? Are your providers upset? Do they love it? Tell you what, a big key is getting your providers to fall in love with shared decision making in the process. And the video, the short video that many of you watched earlier, is one way to start. There's also a longer video, which honestly, it makes me a little teary every time I look at it because I really uh, enjoyed working with the care team when they made that video. Okay, this is the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide Sheet that um, we just talked about. This is a really, really great tool um, for, to help patients uh, with decision support. And you can do that with a coach or you can, they can do that on their own. It's an effective tool and I encourage all clinics to practice using this tool with your colleagues within the clinic. That's what we did. Um, when I went through my coaching, I went to all of my coworkers and I said, do you have a decision you need to make? Let me help you. And we walked through this and they helped me with my, with my coursework. So it can be for any difficult decision. What car should I buy? Should I move? One of my coworkers was wrestling with whether or not to put her mother into an assisted care facility. You can also do one on what are we ordering for lunch today? <laughs> the use of this tool with an online decision support tutorial is very strongly recommended. Let's talk about some shared decision making myths. So we're already doing this. Even trained providers can revert to paternalistic approaches. I met with a provider whom I adore about shared decision making, and he made this comment, in the end, they'll do what I recommend anyway. Sigh. So the shared decision making process can unfold over time. It doesn't have to be a face-to-face -face encounter. For example, the clinical team may recommend materials about a patient's option and possible outcomes to treat the patient so they could read about it and view at home where the insights from decision aid can be shared more readily with friends or family members. Uh, similarly, a patient can send a response to materials electronically through the medical record, or clinicians can study them to learn about the patient's values, preferences. Communication between parties to get to a decision can happen electronically, by telephone, or face-to-face -to, -face, to some extent, depending on the health consequences of the decision. The result should be a decision where the patient was informed and had their goals and concerns meaningfully reflected in the choice. When time is limited, as it is so often in modern healthcare, decision aids can present the options and outcomes in a standard way including visual tools such as icon arrays that have been shown to improve the communication of risks. Now, I know there's more than one of you out there that has had patients come in, have patients come in with a stack of information from Google, from their auntie, from anyone, and they're completely confused. So a decision aid is a fantastic way to present data and information to patients in a literacy, in a, in a balanced way that is um, appropriate for all help, health literacy levels, 
uh, that they can understand without having to wade through Dr. Google. So many patients will approach a healthcare decision assuming that there is one right choice for how to proceed and that the clinician who went to medical or nursing school is the best person to get to the right answer. I've been guilty of asking my provider in the past before I knew about your decision making, hey doc, what will you do in my case? I know there's many of you out there that probably said the exact same thing. In truth, many and perhaps even most medical problems have more than one medically reasonable way to, step, to proceed to establish a diagnosis or embark on treatment. A clinician's invitation for a patient to participate in decision making under these circumstances may be the most important step in shared decision making. Invite the patient to participate. Research in a network of shared decision making demonstration sites around the country has found that when patients understand that they face a medical decision with the multiple reasonable options, the great majority want to participate. The desire to participate is not influenced by age, gender, or level of education. Undoubtedly, some people, and perhaps particularly from specific cultural backgrounds, will still want to defer the final decision to the clinician. However, in that case, the clinician can make the decision in consideration of the patient's values and preferences rather than their own. Research has also demonstrated that without a discussion, clinicians do not do well at predicting when patients, what patients care most about related to a healthcare decision. This is demonstrated in a study done at Mass General Hospital with breast cancer surgeons who were talking with patients who were facing mastectomy versus lumpectomy. And the providers had assumed that the most important thing for the patient was to retain the breast. And patients, uh, when they were queried about it, the most important thing was for them to be alive. Shared decision making is often thought about in the context of major one-time decisions for surgery or cancer treatment. However, shared decision making is also applicable when there is more than one medically reasonable approach. Of course, it's impractical to go through a detailed shared decision making process for minor decisions. But decisions in the management of chronic disease or prevention are also reasonable candidates for shared decision making. For example, glycemic targets for diabetes management or the threshold to prescribe a statin medication for primary prevention are both good candidates for shared decision making. And there are decision aids out there for those on the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute website. <clears throat> the management of chronic conditions also involves, uh, often involves a sequence of of small decisions that incorporate the patient's values and preferences to be successful. For instance, taking a shared decision-making approach for asthma management has been demonstrated to improve patient-reported and physiologically measured pulmonary function outcomes. So wrapping up, there are resources out there and we've covered several of them today. The Dartmouth-Hitchcock Toolkit is a great place to start. There's one for primary care and one for specialty care. Start small, then spread to other teams. Refine your processes as just like any other quality improvement project. Involve all members of the care team from the front office to the back. Remember, your front office folks could play a very important role in helping identify patients appropriate for shared decision making. Develop clinic-specific patient clinic-specific patient materials to inform patients of this new process of shared decision-making. So on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Toolkit website, you will find examples of posters that they have created for shared decision-making, and you can download those and personalize them with your own clinic information. You can add your own images of your own clinic. It just is a place for you to start. Make sure you advertise shared decision-making to your patients. An endorsement by the care team can be the very most important step. So here's a couple more resources to share with you. AHRQ has an approach to shared decision making called the SHARE approach. And there's a link to that website to learn more about the AHRQ SHARE approach. So this second bullet point, these are, um, this is a link to a long version of the video that many of you watched. This is about nine minutes long. And uh, these videos are free to use. You can actually, we've, I've been to many clinics that have a television in the waiting room where they have a looping PowerPoint with information. I've gone to clinics that are doing shared decision making and they've included slides on shared decision making. This is a video that you can loop periodically throughout in your waiting room if you'd like. It's very entertaining. I like to watch it. So there's a long version and a short version. 
And this last bullet point, there are 19 key articles. There's many, many more than that. But there are 19 key articles in this handout from the Minnesota Shared Decision Making Collaborative. And they pull together these 19 great articles and an abstract. So if you come from a very research-oriented clinic and your providers or staff really want to know the details about this and they want to see the data behind it, it's a great place to go to get more information on shared decision making. Great. And here are some references that I used for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg. And now we have some um, time set aside for questions. I think you covered a lot of information, and I really appreciate some of the um, personal stories that you had to bring to bear and um, the you know, clinics that you've worked with or you've heard about working with. I mean, that's, I think that's what's really exciting for me is to learn more about. And so one of the questions that I have for you while other people are um, continuing to submit their questions via the chat is, um, what sort of pitfalls have you noticed? You know, people start down the road. I know you have those seven steps, but, mm -hmm. but what things can go wrong that people mm -hmm. should keep an eye out for? Absolutely. I think check bandwidth when you're starting any new project. Make sure you have the bandwidth in your clinic to do this. Are you facing, um, you know, are you applying for NCQA? Are you facing a patient center medical home site visit? I mean, um, what are some of the things you on the line that might get in the way? Uh, do you have provider turnover? Do you have new providers joining your staff? Make sure you've got um, an ample runway for this project. Another one is clinics that um, have difficulty identifying patients because they don't see them that often or they're not able to identify them through billing codes or through condition codes. Um, so you have to be able to uh, have some data management capabilities in your clinic through your practice management system. We're not talking about having a, a, a huge data analyst on board, but just being able to identify those patients that are needed for recalls, for maybe mammograms or for colorectal cancer screening. Um, those are the patients. Start with an easy target. Start with low-hanging fruit, and you'll have successes, and then it'll really propel your project to move forward. I love that, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important for any project. Right. I remember the, the quick, easy wins yep. that you can do just to get started. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> another question we had was, um, how often are the decision aids updated with the most recent evidence-based information? Great. So when I worked at the uh, Informed Medical Decisions, Foundation, Decisions Foundation in Boston, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, we updated our decision aids every two years, and they're based on USPSTF guidelines. And we had a series of medical editors from around the country. These were really specialists in their area of treatment and condition. And they were our medical editors. And so they always had their ear to the rail for the latest studies, the studies that were coming out. And if um, a recommendation changed, uh, we made sure that we had those decision aids updated. Now, the decision aids that are on the Ottawa research site, uh, those are all IPGOS rated. And that is an international decision aid uh, rating that's out there that's been developed through for shared decision making. And they're all rated based upon how they were developed, if they're evidence-based, if they're balanced. You won't find decision aids that are produced by pharma out there. Uh, most of these are produced by researchers. So yeah, and research teams. So yeah, they're regularly updated. They have to be. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um, the, another tag along question to that, you mentioned uh, all these decision aids being at an appropriate literacy level. Mm -hmm. literacy level. Mm -hmm. Um, what about availability in different languages? Absolutely. You'll see that on the Ottawa site. Um, on There's a decision aid summary sheet for each uh, decision aid, and it'll tell you which languages they're available in. And also, the decision support tutorial and the trainings are available in multiple languages as well. So if you're working with patients who speak Spanish or French, um, they're available in other languages. It's also important to note that that decision aid summary sheet has the key facts. And we found in our research when I was with the foundation that providers were reticent to engage into a conversation where the patient might be more informed than they were. You know, we ask our providers to remember so much. And when we present that information to patients, providers were a little bit worried that perhaps the patient would maybe know more or ask hard questions about some really hard facts or data that the provider may not have at their hands. So those decision aid summary sheets have basically the cliff notes. So it has the, the top information. So some clinics actually kept those laminated in the exam room so the patient can refer to those. So it's kind of like a, a blankie, if you were, <laughs> to provide some comfortability for the provider in having that conversation. That's really helpful. And I, I, I think this has um, been so helpful for me. And, and thank you to folks who have said that this has been a really helpful presentation. Oh, great. Um, I, you mentioned how important it was to include patients in your decision to actually implement mm -hmm. shared decision making. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you had some stories for yeah, us. I sure do. I sure do. 
So um, at Winding Waters Medical Clinic in Enterprise, Oregon, and um, full disclosure, I'm on the patient advisory council there. Um, that's, my, that's my clinic. Uh, that's where I go for my care. When they started to implement shared decision making long before I made my way to Malala County, they involved their patients and their patient advisory council from step one. They had them review the decision aids. They had them review the process. Is this something that they thought their fellow members in the community would want to participate in? Was it too intimidating? Um, it's a very, very rural community where I live. There's 7,000 people in my entire county, and the county is larger than the state of Delaware. So we're, we're pretty far out out there in eastern Oregon. Another thing that they did is that they um, vetted the training for the providers, and they um, were just enamored with shared decision making. The patient advisory council was. So when they involved their patient advisory council on the construction of a brand new beautiful clinic, the patient advisory council demanded to have a kiosk area built in the waiting room to display shared decision making tools. They felt that strongly about it. That's so exciting. Isn't it great? And they all, they're also the ones that helped develop that kind of tiny takeout menu about shared decision making options. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. what they want. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, and then Jill Boyd is on the oh, call, and she Hi, <laughs> said that they're, they're also at the public library. Yeah, they, absolutely. At the, at the public library, they're in, in Hefner, at the public library, and they're also in Enterprise. So they wanted to make these tools available for everybody. Um, they had them at the post office for a while on um, you know, one of the walls. You can get your tax forms, and you can get a decision aid about colorectal cancer screening, or about do you want to have a PSA, or about chronic low back pain. So, yeah, that's so exciting. Yeah, that's really, really, oh, man, I'm just getting goosebumps there. Right? Yeah, true. Um, there, you know, I think it's important sometimes to remember that these, you know, processes don't exist in a vacuum, too. And, right. and have you encountered any concerns from people about, uh, you know, our clinic's not, not ready to be even as culturally competent in our care, and so what if we start, you know, providing this information for people, and we're not ready to, to have a, a larger conversation, and we're, we're not ready to, I mean, has that come up at all? I mean, not just language, but also cultural. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, the example I gave of this provider who I, who I do, I still adore him, um, but it really shocked me. I thought, come on now, you know better than that. You've been trained in this. But it is possible to revert back, and I think some of the things that cause providers or staff to revert back is just lack of time. Uh, they just they, they they know what's best for the patient. They know what the majority of the patients choose, and so they're going to you know make that the, the choice for the patient. But when the patient is involved and engaged in their decision, just like in care plans, you know when we build good care plans and we have patient goals, it's striking how many times when I see care plans that the patient goals are totally different than the care team goals. The care team could be let's get your HbA1c under eight. The patient could be I want to be able to walk to the softball field to be able to watch my grandson play. So, you know, patients bring so much to the encounter, and it's really important to give them permission. So for clinics that maybe have some work to do in culture, show that video, soften those hearts, get the, tissue, get the tissue box out. I know I was a little weepy when I saw the long one. And <clears throat> start small. Start with a discrete decision, such as colorectal cancer screening. That's a great way to start. It can be difficult to identify those patients. As we know, we don't do them in the primary care office, that so they have to get that care somewhere else. But those are appropriate patients to start with, because you can identify them pretty easily when they're needed and invite them to, to chime in, because there's multiple options now that are evidence-based for colorectal cancer screening. You can do a FIT, an FOBT. Um, you can do a you know, sigmoidoscopy, or you can do a colonoscopy. So let the patient participate in that decision, what fits best for them. Start small. Awesome. Again, it's again with a reminder to start small mm -hmm. and just, just get started. Just, just get started. Get mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, do you know if there are tools related to outpatient um, PT or optometry? So this is a specialty. There very well could be on the Ottawa research. I don't have my laptop in front of me right now. I'm looking at, at Rebecca's laptop. But um, there very well could be. So check on the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute website. And if it's out there, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. So they connect to other other resources. Mm -hmm. Yes, as well. they do. It's this is the gathering. This is the gathering place, the clearinghouse for decision aids that are developed by researchers across the country and around the world. Awesome. And um, I'm also being reminded to ask your um, your contacts at Health Insight or your QIO contacts to help you connect you to these resources or to, to help you in your implementation journey. So um, reach out. There are several of them on the call today. And um, 
you had, you had a question maybe for, or did you have a question for the audience so we could see if people wanted to raise their hand and, and share? About their sure. I know. Um, I know there's folks out there that have implemented shared decision making. Is anybody willing to raise their hand and maybe share a success story or a, a tip or trick that you want to share with the rest of the folks? We're not scary. We promise. We're not scary. I promise. You can raise your hand by clicking on the little hand icon next to your name, and um, we'll unmute you. We'll make sure you're unmuted. But um, or if you're super brave, you can post. You can raise your hand and say, "We tried this and it didn't work." I'll do a quick, a quick diagnosis and see how I can fix it from from afar, from here in Portland. Maybe maybe not quite yet. Then he's shy. That's fine. That is like, oh, we did. We, oh, we had someone briefly. Oh, Jill Boyd. Ah. Hi guys, this is Jill Boyd, and um, so I've worked a lot with our rural practices and implementing shared decision making. Uh, both in Enterprise and Hepner and in Baker City and uh, of those sites our Baker City site really did have a lot of problems implementing uh, the shared decision-making uh, process and the dis and using the decision aids and it got, I just wanted to comment and go back to Meg's point about getting leadership on board is so very important and I think um, you know, in the, in the sites that we worked with out here in Eastern Oregon, um, the Winding Waters Clinic and Enterprise, um, they had that leadership, they had that engagement, they involved those patients, and it just really worked uh, seamlessly over the, 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 the years that they've been doing this, and the same process in Hepner. And unfortunately, we saw the, the exact opposite uh, because leadership just wasn't engaged. They didn't see the value. They weren't watching the videos. Um, and so it took them a lot longer to really start to see the value and the importance of implementing shared decision making in their clinic. So it's not really a, a success story. It's more of a, a real challenge that we've seen out here um, specifically with you know, if you don't have those leaders on board and you don't have a clinician champion and you don't involve those patients, um, then you really are, it's going to be a much more of an uphill battle for you guys. So that's just kind of our, our lessons learned from the field. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jill. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, we have a, a few more minutes, too, if, if somebody else wants to um, chime in. And actually, I'm going to call on and Zetik Sumner, you've been um, she's been chatting in a lot with uh, with some fantastic comments and okay. questions. Hi, Anne. Um, and uh, if we can unmute you. Hi, Anne. You're unmuted. If you would like to say a few words about um, you were talking about how important it is to to ask the patient what or she's not able to come on. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll summarize kind of your chat here. Um, you're, she was talking about how important it is to ask the patient who they usually talk to about their decision. Mm -hmm. And then once you have a conversation about that, take that information and fold that into the process. Ask that person who they trust, too, what would be helpful, what information they need. And so I think that goes back to what you're saying. Exactly. So the decision aid tools um, you know, need to be portable, that they can either be sent through a portal or they can be handed out at the clinic for the patient to review and talk about with their family members. And it can be for even colorectal cancer screening options, you know, um, other screening procedures, or something as important as end-of-life care. I mean, that's a really important one. And there are resources out there to support patients in end-of-life care and making those really, really difficult decisions. So it's important to take into account all of the folks that help that patient make the decisions. are going to have to live with the consequences of the decisions. So one thing to add about that Mass General study where they had a and the, when Winding Waters did it too, where they had that little kind of Chinese takeout list, they were really befuddled because they were finding that female patients were requesting things such as um, um, PSA testing. And so they had a conversation with some of the patients and said, you know this is for prostate, right? And they said, oh yeah, it's for my husband. I want my husband to watch this, or my boyfriend, or my partner. So it was great. So they were kind of shopping for decision aids for the whole family. But really, you know, it's important to involve those around you. Um, I can't stress enough to go through the Ottawa Decision Support tutorial online. It, it takes several hours, but you can um, actually start and stop at any time. It's pretty tough, I'll be honest with you, um, but it's really worth it to go through that. And then practice with that 
Ottawa Personal Decision Guide. That's a great, great tool to use. You can practice on each other in the clinic. And that was a PDF I saw that you could yep. just download yep, it out. Absolutely. It's and it's based, based on stars. And I think that even comes in Portuguese. It comes in multiple, multiple wow. languages. Yes. That's impressive. I um, I wanted to remind everybody too that the even though the links you couldn't click on them on the slides here, but um, the PDF of the slides will yep. be available with active links. Yep. So uh, you can refer back to them after this. The web the webinar recording will be available as well. Um, it's been really tremendously helpful. We have just a couple more minutes if you wanted to share final final words of wisdom. Um, you know, people have watched this webinar, they're getting excited, hopefully we've gotten you excited, and they're ready to take this back to their their team. Right. Um, this isn't just a, a phenomenon here in the U.S. I mean, it's very uh, big in Canada, and also the National Health Service in the U.K. has implemented shared decision making, and they have a real, a real push for it in the NHS system, and it's very much supported there. Uh, they see the value in bringing the patients to the table and making them part of the conversation. So, um, just remember that. Remember your patients. Remember in the end, we're all patients. One day we're all going to be patients, and people that we love are patients too, and so we want the very, very best for them. We want their voices to be heard and recognized and acknowledged, and their opinions acknowledged too. So I wanted to thank everybody for calling in today and taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. It does my heart good to see so many uh, fellow uh, patient advocates out there. Um, so thank you, and continue the good work. Thank you so much. And thank you, yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And, and thank you so much, Mike, for lending your expertise and your oh, passion. And it really comes through talking to you about this. So. Well, I believe in it. I used it myself. <laughs> it works. And it works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm excited. I, I want to take a look at the, the resources. Um, and then just before we um, head off, there, a reminder that the next um, Learning in Action Network webinar will be Wednesday, October 26th. This one will focus on patient referrals to self-management programs. So please do um, join us then, and you can click on that link once the, the slides are posted to register directly there. And please do spend um, two minutes filling out your um, post-webinar survey. That really helps us. It helps our presenters know what's yeah. valuable and, and what we can do differently. So um, with that, though, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your Thursday. It is Thursday, Friday <laughs> Eve. Friday <laughs> Eve. All right, take care. Bye.